as the speaker, I want to introduce her as the winner of a vol the Volunteer of the Year Award. And so, since she was not here last night, we'll present this to her now. And I'll tell you a little bit about why she's the Volunteer of the Year. When we say volunteer and volunteer of the year, what does that really mean? Because we're all volunteers in various ways. But Whitney is, is sort of unique. She not only gives generously of her time, but she gives of her spirit uh, in many, many ways. She's very active in the New Orleans support group. She speaks on behalf of the foundation. Uh, she has worked with uh, the Tim Tebow Foundation and, and has uh, gotten uh, donations from that foundation to the MGFA. She contributes the proceeds from her popsicle and cupcake uh, ventures, uh, her various cookbooks. She, uh, the proceeds come to the foundation and she's in the process of writing another cookbook, soon to be published. It's unique when you get somebody who sort of gives of their whole self, not just a little bit of time or a, a few dollars here or there, but is truly committed to those ventures that she supports. And that's really who Whitney Miller is. Uh, she's got a connection because her father, father and mother are both here this, after, this morning. Father has MG. Uh, but it's more than that. I mean, it's, it's a total commitment. And that's, I think, what each of us here uh, aspires to do and aspires to be. And uh, I think you'll enjoy what Whitney has to say. Take it to heart, because it can help you in many ways. And take the time to walk up later and thank Whitney for all of the good things she's doing for the foundation and for each of you. So with that, Whitney, it's all yours. Thank you for having me again. Um, I was able to speak uh, when the conference was in Las Vegas, and it was actually my family's first time to uh, come to the conference because my dad had just recently been diagnosed. And I immediately, um, as soon as he was diagnosed, it's just kind of my mom and I's nature. We like to research. We like to know. Um, and so we wanted, as his caregivers, because I was still living at home at the time, to do the best we could to know ourselves before meeting with any doctors what was MG. We wanted to understand it for ourselves. And in my part, I thought, well, there's got to be a way I can use my cooking background. And I was still in uh, college at the time, and I was studying nutrition. I thought, there's got to be a way. And I remembered, because I was towards the end of, um, I think, in my senior year when my dad started um, having symptoms. And once he was diagnosed, I thought, you know what? I remember in my nutrition studies, my senior gravis. So I was able to look back and see some of those symptoms and, and the different things that would help. But it was interesting that, you know, I've heard from um, some different people that are nurses. It is one of those little um, diseases that you faintly remember studying, and I did as well in my nutrition. But I have done a lot of research, and this is everything that I give you today is based off of um, interviews that I've done with other people that have MG for the past four years since he was diagnosed in 2011 to things that I've been able to do for him that's helped. And it's all, as you know, individualized of what you're, you deal with on a daily basis with your MG. So maybe something that I have done to help my dad and some others will help you today. So this is how I have um, a part in knowing about MG and um, help with MG is because my dad was diagnosed with it in 2011. This is um, him and I at last year's uh, New Orleans Walk. So he was diagnosed in 2011. Um, he began uh, after being on uh, Mesanon for a while. Uh, he f was luckily able to just start out on Mesanon, but it was a medication that he wasn't able to deal with. And it was interesting because food played a part because for him, it would mess up his stomach. And so we did a little research and bananas. He would eat a banana every time he took his medicine on. And for some reason, whatever was in it helped him to be able to settle his stomach 
to where he could manage taking it four times a day. I told him, Dad, by the time taking it four times a day for an extended period of time, you've got to be sick of bananas, but he still likes bananas. But if you're having a problem, maybe that little tip with the bananas would help. But after um, having some troubles and he had a crisis and he did end up having to get on prednisone, I did research immediately because I knew there's so many different things and side effects that I wanted to make sure he would maybe buy what he was eating would help with that. Um, you know, like the diabetes and um, uh, hypertension and, um, and also just the fact of the weight gain. And I just knew with everything else that you deal with, there's, if there's any way that you could, you know, not will deal with the weight gain or, or the stress. So I would look up foods that help with um, his energy level while he's at work and foods that maybe internally kind of help with your stress. But to battle the weight gain, I tried to make sure he was following a very low salt and sugar diet. So being a chef, for me to not use salt in any of my cooking for a whole year, and that would be me actually adding salt to a dish. Now, it's hard if I'm making like a soup and you're using like a stock and it has some salt in it, but I would try to find the unsalted version. Try to use fresh things, but I'm gonna talk a little bit later about, or further down, there's salt in everything. And so I just had to try to make sure I would look at even things like bread. You just don't think about how much salt is in things. Um, and then with the sugar, I just, you know, try to make sure he was staying away from um, anything that had sugar in it, desserts, um, and then he would incorporate fruit. But for him, uh, throughout the time that he was on a high dose of prednisone, he gained about five to 10 pounds. And so I know with a lot of you being on, you know, if at a point if you've been on a high dosage, you know that the weight gain is a factor. And I just contribute that his diet may have played a part in how he didn't gain as much weight. But salt is in everything package. I've done so much research myself through that time and still on trying to keep the salt amount low. Um, I found bread from a local bakery and it was a Russian rye and I looked at the nutrition amounts and I asked them actually I think for that information and that was the lowest salt level but for me I didn't even think about myself how much salt even bread could have but um, this was before and I'm going to talk about in a little bit later now he's on a gluten-free diet so that's not a necessary factor but there's salts and peanut butter, there's salts in cereal, and, and things that you don't even, you know, think about, how much salt's in cheese. So I would make homemade peanut butter for him. Um, this just shows how much sodium is in something like peanut butter that's store-bought. Now, thankfully, you can just go and churn it, you know, yourself. In the grocery stores, they have the sections, so you don't have to make it yourself. But if you do want to venture, it's super easy. Um, you can go to my website, and I'm going to share that at the end, how to make your own homemade peanut butter. And the ingredient is nothing but salt. I mean, nothing but salt. Nothing but I have salt on the brain. <laughs> nothing but peanuts, as you can see. Um, but it's, I mean, you don't have to add anything else. Yes, no, not just salt. <laughs> There's salt in the store vault. Um, and then w during the time that I was doing the low salt diet, uh, I had to think, how am I going to add flavor to these foods? Because my whole family is doing this, not just him. I mean, when anything happens in my family, we're very, uh, or, or to one person in my family, we're very um, supportive. So we weren't just going to single out my dad as, oh, well, you can't have this, but then let us all have this, because to me, that's not very fair. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure, okay, if I'm not having salt, how can I make these dishes flavorful? So I really challenged myself, and I used a lot of garlic, um, onions. I tried to use anything that I could that I knew that would add flavor. Um, fresh herbs definitely heighten flavor. And um, spices, just make sure if you use a spice, it's just the one spice. It's not combinations, unless it's like, I know McCormick does those that don't have the salt. But a lot of those combination ones have salt added. And then um, even citrus. Citrus has tons of flavor. If you do just the zest part, which is that outer part, and you can grate it, it's amazing how much you can like brighten a dish up. And um, speaking of herbs, 
So um, initially when he was diagnosed, my mom and I was doing a lot of traveling. And I did pretty much all the cooking when I lived at home. And so my dad was fortunate enough to not really have to cook until my mom and I, in um, 2012, I guess it was, we traveled to four different countries. And during that period of time, we were gone for a good bit. So I was worried about my dad not cooking for himself and what he was eating. So I'm Skyping him at a particular time, and we're in some other country, and he said, well, you'd be proud of me because I made homemade soup. And I said, oh, you did? Wow, Dad. <laughs> I thought you just did, like, eggs. And so I'm, I'm very excited. And then he said, yep, I even added bay leaf. And I was like, bay leaf? Oh, okay, yeah, you know, from your garden. And I was like, Dad, I don't have bay leaf in my herb garden. I'm not quite sure what you added to that soup. And it ended up, it was ba um, basil, but he thought it was bay leaf, and it scared me for a minute because I thought, oh, gosh, he's by himself, and he, I don't know what he's using. But um, he tried, so he was even trying to use herbs to flavor his uh, dishes himself. Some easy cooking tips, and these are ones not just to think about, you know, for, for you, but anybody. Um, I do this on a regular occasion if I'm just trying to quickly make a meal and I don't want to take out my cutting board and my knife because to me, I'm very minimalistic. I don't like to wash dishes. So I'm thinking, how can I get away with using less items to prepare a meal? So if you don't want to use the knife and the cutting board, just use a grater to do your garlic, even your onions. I mean, it's going to finally, you know, um, process it. Uh, the only thing I um, had thought about is because my mom had just recently told me she had my dad grating something and that repetitive motion. So if you're doing it for an extended period of time, like a whole block of cheese, then you might want to go to your food processor with the attachment that has the grater. Because for him, anytime he's doing like a real repetitive motion, it weakens those muscles. So that's just one thing to think about. But for a little small head of garlic, it's not going to take much. I like to use, um, and it's Ninja, the only reason I say the name is just so you'll know, but it's a little food chopper, and to me, um, my food processor is heavy, it's bulky, it's more of um, like a difficulty to clean, so on a regular basis, if you don't use a food processor, get a food chopper, because you'll really realize how much it can come in handy. You can do your peanut butter in it, um, you can make homemade hummus, Pestos, like use those herbs to in, in your cooking with like a, a pesto that's super easy. Um, anything that you would use a food processor for, you can use a food chopper to make smoothies. I mean, I use it, and usually um, I think the ninjas are pretty cheap, but I even had one from Walmart. I don't think that was a ninja, and it costs like $20, I think. So a cheaper version as well. And one of the best ways and easiest ways is sometimes I do not want to be over the stove cooking. And especially if you're having to stir things and you're just on your feet and you're going to tire yourself out, do everything in the oven. Try to plan it where your meats are something that's baking or grilling, and then your, vo your vegetables are in the oven as well. And to me, the best flavor out of any vegetable is roasting. And that just means it's on a high temperature, so 400 degrees. You add a little bit of olive oil, salt, pepper, and most of the time I use garlic and onion for every vegetable. Um, if, you like, if you don't like Brussels sprouts and you roast them with garlic and onion, it just caramelizes them and just, to me, just adds so much sweetness to something that if you originally had them and you thought, oh, this is awful, it's bitter, but it transforms any vegetable. I promise you, even vegetables that I thought I would never like, I've roasted them and it has done it. And it usually takes, depending on like the type of vegetable, if it's a root vegetable, it's going to take about maybe 40 minutes. If it's something a little softer, it'll take about 30 minutes. But um, there's recipes on my website, again, for even roasting. So for my dad, um, after doing um, the salt, low salt and things, um, and he was on prednisone, um, he still had some double vision, and I thought, well, maybe there's something else that I could do for him with his diet that we could try. So I did a lot of research, and you know, I talked to some people, and 
from every spectrum. Some people were doing vegan, some were doing just vegetables, real clean eating. And I thought, well, maybe gluten-free because he also has some um, allergies and he's done like a yeast-free diet before. So for him, when I started doing the gluten-free and he's done it for an extended period of time and he would go on and off, but it has definitely helped, I believe, lower his doses, dosage that he's had to be on with prednisone. And it's helped his double vision, um, his strength. I mean, I remember at a point he couldn't even uh, get on a lawnmower and mow our lawn. Uh, he couldn't drive. I mean, there was just certain things that I remember his strength level being so low. And then I just got married um, last November, and my dad's on a bush hog, and he's bush hogging our property for my barn wedding. And it just is amazing to me to see how much strength he has. And, you know, I definitely don't know specifically um, for him how this is working for that strength level and the, the um, double vision to not be there, but I can only say what is it? It's not hurting him to be on this type of diet. I mean, it's not a drug that has side effects. So it's definitely something you might consider. If you are thinking this might be something you would want to try, um, to me, there's a lot of things gluten-free that could not taste very well, so I've tried to figure out the things that do. Um, Udy's is a brand that they have bread, and to me, that's the best one out there. So I just wanted to give you that information, and it's best to keep it refrigerated because it preserves longer. And then the best way to eat it, because it does kind of have a spongy texture if you just eat it straight out of uh, the bag, is I'll heat um, a skillet and just put a little bit of either a little tiny bit of butter. I mean, it just needs to be a nonstick skillet. Basically, you're wanting to toast each side of it. And for me, it just gives it where it's more like a pillowy texture in the center and you have that little crunch. But anytime I do um, like a, a burger or if we do sandwiches, that's the way that um, he'll have it is the toasted and then put the meat or whatever on it. Um, there's all kinds of um, gluten-free starches and grains. Here's a few of them. Um, I mean, he can eat uh, everything that was corn related. So a corn tortilla, so he's not limited if we go out to eat um, Mexican. He can still have the corn tortillas. Um, rice, of course, quinoa, uh, flax. Um, there's all kinds of different flours out there. But for me, um, some I had in the beginning tried all these different flours and put my own combinations together, but it can get expensive. So an easy way for my mom to be able to prepare gluten-free now for him is there's certain brands, again, that they already have for you. So like Biscuit Gluten-Free, it makes the best biscuits. There's um, a really good one out there called Maple Grove Farms. I'm going to show you um, a product of theirs, and I make pancakes with it. I mean, you don't have to spend a lot on all these different products. They have it for you, and um, it tastes really good. And remember oats. Um, not all oats are gluten-free. You just have to look for the ones that are. And Mayo Clinic has a whole list of um, things that are gluten-free for you. This is just some of the things that I'll make. Um, the pancakes I'll tell you, I mean, they're, I make these on a regular. I like them better than regular pancakes. Um, and that's the brand Maple Grove Farms, if you want to write that down. And then I'll make granola bars for him. This is something filling. And again, the whole thing's gluten-free. Um, and I do use, of course, you know, some sugar, but I'll try to be smart, like um, I'll use uh, maple syrup because it has more nutritional properties to it, agave because it doesn't raise your blood um, sugar levels, and um, some other things like you can still have your pasta. You can do gluten-free pasta, or um, my husband and I have really found we like spaghetti squash, and we'll use it as a base for a lot of things. Um, if you're nervous to try it, give it a try because it's super easy to prepare. Again, I just roast the, um, the spaghetti squash. I just cut it in half, put it on uh, tin foil on a baking sheet because, again, that means easy cleanup. You just take the tin foil and throw it away. You don't have to wash the dish. And um, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour, and you just want it to feel soft. Then you turn it over and you just scrape it. And you'll see like the little strands. 
And sometimes there's a lot of water content, so just put it in a strainer and just kind of let some of those extra um, natural, you know, vegetable juices drain. And you can serve it just like you would spaghetti meatballs. And again, you don't even, if you, I make homemade meatballs and I don't use any kind of bread in it. Um, that will be a recipe in my second book. So this is another easy way that for my mom to prepare something like enchiladas that I came up with this recipe. It's an enchilada stack, so there's no work in rolling. So if, you're, um, if you have MG and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I just have to, you know, this repetitive motion of making these enchiladas, this is the easier way. It's just all the ingredients are stacked together. And um, look for, because, you know, there's cheese in here, a lower sodium type cheese. I know there's um, lower fat cheeses, and I think that might play a difference in how much sodium. Uh, this is what I would make when I want biscuits that are gluten-free. This is the Bisquick version, and I do kind of tweak the recipe. I think it calls for like three eggs, and for me, that makes more of a dense biscuit, so I use an egg and an egg white, and it makes it, that's a, less fat, as well as a fluffier biscuit. And then the gravy I made with um, wild hog sausage, so it's less fat, and um, the gluten-free flour to make the roux. So you don't have to give up the things that you love, you just have to kind of tweak it to make it work for you. And then my aunt, she makes gumbo, and she's even having to follow a gluten-free diet because of an autoimmune uh, disease that she has. So for her, she said, I'm not going to just have everybody else enjoy the gumbo that I make for them. I want to be able to enjoy it myself. So she uses a corn flour. So all of her cooking that she does for herself on gluten-free is with corn flour. There are some other options. Um, for me, basically how he follows his gluten-free is pretty similar to like a low-carb type diet. Um, he still tries to stay away from like white potatoes and certain things that would um, turn into sugar in your body. And I had um, a fellow MG friend that told me about how he was following a low carb diet. I immediately noticed that he was slimmer than the last time that I saw him, so I knew he was doing something different. Um, he said it has helped his double vision, um, he has been able to decrease his prednisone dosage. And um, of course, you know, the weight loss because of not intaking as many carbs. Now there is a science that his um, wife said was behind it that she thought. She researched and your body temperature increases when it's trying to break down carbs versus if it's trying to break down fat in your body. And think about if you're in a um, really extreme, like hot temperature. I remember my dad going to Florida and that temperature change from where we were in Mississippi to extremely hot Florida, it messed with his MG and it made him weaker. So the same thing I'm guessing occurs in your body, or it could, if your temperature is raising to break down carbs, then it might be, in fact, making your muscles weaker with your body. So that might be something you want to think about. And another thing that I researched um, just recently is there's actually something called an autoimmune protocol diet. Um, it's something that you could look up. Um, I didn't do much research on it myself um, just because there was a lot to it and um, just because of how well my dad's doing on his particular type of eating. But um, it might be something you can even talk to your doctor about when you think about looking it up and you're thinking about following it because it is very um, intricate with foods you can and cannot have. But other people, um, I talked to a dietitian who has clients and she said she does have some NG clients on this type of diet. So I've talked about several different um, tips and recipes. Um, I did even a slide on my website that you can go to on my website and look up um, on MG. There's several recipes. You can ask me questions on any of those social media sites. Um, I've just recently had several people contact me, and either they found out I had some relation to MG, and they wanted to ask me, what am I, what am I doing for my dad? Because they've seen posts that I made. But I wanted to click over to my website, just so that you're familiar with it, and you'll um, know what it looks like. If you go in, 
you just go to that recipe section and I put in peanut butter. So here's the homemade peanut butter recipe. And I just wanted to show you how some of the recipes will look. And in my second book, uh, which comes out in November, you'll be able to have step-by-step -step recipes too because, again, I'm a visual person. And if you don't like to cook or you need something to see, well, mine doesn't look like that, then you'll have something to compare it to. So again, you just put peanuts. And I like to um, roast them in the oven, just kind of bake them, and it adds a little more flavor. Or you can find already roasted peanuts. And then it turns into a powder, and then it turns into this like kind of thicker mixture, and it's still a little bit of um, grainy, and then the smoothie, creamy texture. And what's interesting to me is that, you know how you usually see in the natural peanut butter, there's a little bit of oil on the top? And I thought, oh gross, they added oil to my peanut butter? But that's, it's natural oils that just come up. So if you happen to see that, if you make it homemade and you're thinking, where did this come from? That's natural. There's several other recipes. Let me just see if I can look up another. Yes, I have all kinds of, um, yeah, that might be not so healthy, but I do have <laughs> bacon wrap stuffed. <laughs> but I do have some healthy recipes on here as well. Um, my second book, um, if you want to look up, uh, I have a picture of what it looks like, and its release date is in November. So um, a part of when the first book came out, um, I did a thing where such, um, a certain amount from each cell would go to MG, and I plan on doing the same with the second one. So I'd love for all of your support. Um, it's called Whitney Miller's New Southern, Kit New Southern Table. And um, I just have a heart for, um, I feel like, people more who are dealing with all kinds of things, you know, whether it's um, symptoms from MG and your daily life to, you know, people that have diabetes. And so I'm constantly creating recipes to help people uh, because to me, food uh, can be a comfort thing. And I don't ever want it to be something that, you know, you're restricted on. If you're restricted on something, like hardly any salt, you can still have good flavorful food. And to me, I feel like that made my dad's mood so much better. When he was on that high dosage of prednisone, I remember him coming in and he was in that like ravenous stage and he was starving every time he came home. And I mean, it was kind of scary. And I thought, okay, this is going to also contribute to him gaining weight. So I've got to think of what's a healthy snack that I could have ready for him when he comes home from work. So for him, it was his bread with his homemade peanut butter, and he'd put bananas on it. And that was his go-to snack. And if he knew, OK, this is something I can have, and this is going to be healthy for me, then that would sustain that appetite. But you know, I just had to play around. So um, try out food as being a part of how you are helping your MG on a regular basis. Hopefully something that I've told you today will help you um, with your daily living. And um, I just thank you so much for allowing me to be able to speak. And if you have any questions, um, I'm free to answer. Barry, Barry, hold it, hold it, Barry, Barry. <laughs> what role does gluten play? Well, for me, I'm, it's kind of that same idea as these other starchier type uh, flours. Again, I talked about how like the low carb with, if your body's having to break down those carbs and it is raising your blood temperature, then you know maybe that is the weakening of your MG. So with gluten-free, you're not dealing with those same type of starchier flours. It's different because of how those flours are, I guess, scientifically manipulated. Thank you. The salt, it was when you're on that higher dosage of prednisone and you know I wanted to make sure that um, because of the fact there was other things that play a part with the side effects of being on prednisone and I knew you also have more water retention so if I lowered his salt amount, that would help to compensate. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it was the higher dosage that he was on at that beginning. At that point, he was on 60. Mm -hmm. Hey, have you read anything about beets, carrots, and um, artichoke hearts from Israel in particular? Have you, in all of your research that you perhaps have done, mm -hmm. those are the only three foods that I've heard that could potentially help people with myasthenia gravis. I just wanted to know if you've heard anything around those three. I haven't necessarily heard of any with those. Um, there is so much that are coming out, especially even if you think of kind of like that homeopathic type of living um, with, you know, trying to use an essential oil or something to combat, like, if you're sick or whatever. Uh, but I haven't heard of anything like that. I have a question regarding, um, I like to have an occasional vodka and tonic. And I know that tonic has a lot of sodium in it. And um, so do you have any other options for me? Um, to me, because I don't drink carbonated drinks, um, I've found I like to mix like fresh fruit and sparkling water. And it gives you that like carbonated, um, and I don't know if tonic water is that still carbonated kind of bubbliness to it, um, but that, I know carbonated, I don't think carbonated water has any, or at least uh, sparkling water. If it has sodium, then, and if you're on, if you're trying to combat, you know, your lower sugar, your lower salt amounts, then anything, you know, that you could. <laughs> Myasthenics should not drink quinine water. Some people say if you have some people say if you have muscle cramps drink quinine water. Mm -hmm. Myasthenics should not drink quinine. Hmm. It'll show it on the website. Hi. Um, what about protein? Would you prefer? Would you recommend a certain protein, like red meat over white meat, anything like that? Have you noticed anything in your research about that? Um, I mean, just on a healthier level, um, I would try to do like leaner protein. Um, I mean, for myself, but as well as you know, for my dad, he happens to be a deer hunter. So you know, instead of ground beef that has more of the fat content, we'd use deer or ground turkey um, for making like turkey burgers, uh, but definitely that plays a part in that healthier kind of lifestyle. And I know paleo is big on protein. Whitney, you haven't mentioned sugars. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes sugars that we eat, fructan, fructose, things like that, glucose, affect the stomach. Mm -hmm. Obviously, mestinon affects the stomach as well. You mentioned garlic and onions. Happens to be two things that I can't eat that absolutely affect my stomach. Have you also dealt with the sugar content of foods and, and tried to reduce that as well? Uh, initially, um, he, my dad actually had some kind of, um, and I guess it was something either with medication or something with his MG where everything to him tasted sweet. And it was initially when he was diagnosed, um, and he was on Mesonon. And it was just this weird thing that he just went through. So um, at that point, I was, I don't think I saw it in, in vegetables, but just certain, maybe like a tomato sauce that has a little bit of a, you know, sweeter component to it, he would notice it. But I did mention trying at that time, and he still is, on a lower sugar type diet. So he's not having sweets. Um, he has the occasional uh, fruit, like still the banana, but I don't try to cut out all, like, all fruits from his diet because I feel like at least that's a natural part and it's not something he's having on a regular. But with the vegetables, I haven't seen a difference in how it affects him, except with like the white potatoes. I try to keep that away. 
Any other? It was. It was at the very beginning, and he just had this weird, like, affinity to anything that could have had a little bit of a sweet content, and, I mean, he just would not eat it. It was very distasteful to him because it was super sweet, and it wouldn't have been anything that was a dessert. It was regular, you know, your regular, like, entree-type meals, but if it had, I guess, a sweeter component to it of a vegetable, he wouldn't eat it. So was he taking He was taking mestin on. Mm-hmm. Because I've had that off and on for the last four years, so several times a year, my mouth gets I use the same regular way, and I think it's mm-hmm. mesonite. I think it. I think it messes with mesonite. So you're on mesonite. It messes with your taste bud because I don't have any taste buds right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. So sometimes, like it, all of a sudden the taste buds come back and then they go away. I do remember with him as well. It would certain things just would he wouldn't even. And I know that happens um, because I've tried to create recipes for those that are on um, radiation for cancer, and I've dealt with it with my own um, grandfather, and they don't have any, like, taste buds. Um, Like, they don't have a taste for anything. Like, their taste buds are, like, weakened, I guess. But for my dad, he dealt with that same thing where nothing, he didn't really care, nothing had a flavor, but it was just a stage at one point. Any other questions? I think I know why everything tasted so sweet to your father. Because he was around you and you're sweet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you again. Um, again, if you have any questions, um, if there's any foods that you particularly like and you're thinking, Oh, I'd love to lower that salt amount or the fat on it or something. Or if you have any questions from what I've said, feel free to reach out to me in person or um, through my website or those social media sites. But thank you again.